Good morning. Thank you all for joining this important session on the oceans, climate, and biodiversity as part of the annual Capitol Hill Ocean Week. I'm Elizabeth Cousins. I'm the president and CEO of the UN Foundation, and I'm delighted that we could make this session happen during such a challenging time for everyone. Thank you all for tuning in. Everyone on this call knows what a mounting set of pressures there are on the world's most vital systems, our climate, our ecosystems, our health, our economies. And we are seeing in painful daily reality how fundamentally connected they are and how urgent it is to change the mix of behaviors, policies, and practices that cut across and threaten them all. The ocean is central to buffering the planet from soaring temperatures. It's absorbed more than 90% of excess heat in the world since 1970, and it is suffering as a result. As the global ocean becomes warmer, rises higher, loses oxygen, and becomes more acidic at an ever faster pace, the critical ecosystem services and social benefits that the ocean provides, from coastal protection and food security to economic livelihoods and cultural and recreational value, they're all at risk. And the steps we need to take to protect them will be, need to be even more heroic. Now, until recently, this ocean climate nexus wasn't top of mind, nor was the biodiversity on which we all depend. But that is increasingly changing, thanks in no small part to the people on today's panel. We are now at the beginning of a decisive decade for the ocean, the climate and the environment. The United Nations is at the center of that work, generating ideas and providing a forum to shape a more sustainable world that protects both planetary and health. I'm absolutely delighted that on the panel today, we are joined by such esteemed UN colleagues and friends. This is one of the first times we have had UN leaders from climate, oceans, and biodiversity all together to talk about these critical life systems. And we're so pleased that the UN Foundation is able to host what I know will be a powerful, engaging, and truly influential discussion. So with that, I want to thank everybody on the panel today, thank Capitol Hill Ocean Week, and I'm delighted to hand the floor over to our moderator and a climate leader in her own right, the Deputy Director for Oceans at the David and Lucille Packard Foundation, Meg Caldwell. Meg, over to you. Thank you, Elizabeth, and thank you to the UN Foundation for sponsoring this important panel discussion and for creating an ocean desk at the UN Foundation to foster these kinds of interactions and much more moving forward. I am Meg Caldwell, and I lead the ocean conservation team at the David and Lucille Packard Foundation, and I'm just really honored to be the moderator for today's panel. 2020, of course, was billed as a super year for the ocean. And events and actions were planned around the world to call for ocean conservation solutions that would benefit both the health and biodiversity of our ocean and the economic and social well-being of individuals and communities around the world. While COVID-19 ended our ability to come together in person, at least temporarily, it's underscored the importance of ocean health more than ever, bringing into sharp relief the ocean's connections to human health and well-being, our economies, and our food security. The connections among the ocean, climate change, biodiversity, and human well-being are inescapable, and the EU Commission's recent adoption of a new biodiversity strategy demonstrates how vital these connections are and how they can be reinforced and supported through political commitment and collective action. We're fortunate today to have a panel of leaders from across the United Nations system who work at the intersection of these issues and can share with us how, even in the presence of this pandemic, work is progressing to ensure the health of the global ocean. They'll also share with us what the coronavirus pandemic has led to their own work in 2020 and what happens next. We're joined today by Dr. Ko Barrett, Vice Chair of the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, Patricia Espinosa, Executive Secretary of the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change, Dr. Anne Larie Gaudry, Executive Secretary for the Intergovernmental Science Policy Platform on Biodiversity and Ecosystem Services, known as IPIS. Elizabeth Maruma Rama, Acting Executive Secretary of the Convention on Biological Diversity, and Ambassador Peter Thompson, 
the UN Secretary General's Special Envoy for the Ocean. Our first question goes to the leaders of the science organizations, Dr. Barrett and Dr. Larie Gardry. In the past two years, the IPCC and the Intergovernmental Science Policy Platform on Biodiversity and Ecosystem Services have released seminal reports that reshaped our understanding of the relationship between the ocean, climate, and biodiversity. And both of your organizations will be releasing additional important reports on the horizon. What insights do your recent reports provide as we look to tackle these issues now? And how will COVID-19 change the nature of your work going forward? We'll start with Dr. Barrett. Thank you. Um, as you mentioned, Meg, the IPCC, which is the sponsor, job it is to assess the state of our climate, released a report last September on the ocean and cryosphere, the frozen parts of the world, and what is happening to them in a changed climate. This is the time in, in our 30-year history that the IPCC has taken an in-depth look at these regions of the world. The report returns from the top top of the highest mountain portions to the, the ocean and finds that even in these remote places, places where humans have even ventured, have been finding that climate change has left mark. And the ocean, as you know, comp comprises over 70% of the planet, but the largest is uncharted and unexplored. The idea that humankind is fundamentally changing the ocean before we have had a chance to fully understand it is a serious issue to consider. Humankind is contributing to the warming and acidification of our oceans, which in turn changes essential habitat for marine mammals and fisheries, which in turn affects the livelihoods of millions of people around the world who depend on the ocean for sustenance. On top of that, our report found that sea level rise is accelerating with melting glaciers, ice loss from Greenland and Antarctica, now the dominant cause, potentially impacting the many, many people living in coastal areas for centuries to come. And solutions to these problems is a large option to address climate change, requiring unprecedented transition to our transport, food, and municipal systems much like we've begun to see in the shifts in recent years in our energy system to high, to high efficient and renewable sources. How COVID-19 will change the nature of our work going forward might focus two aspects. First, the IPCC is an organization that relies on the voluntary work of hundreds of scientists and experts from all of the world to compile and assess climate information. Governments then review and adopt our this collaboration between scientists and governments around the world is essential to the veracity of our reports. But COVID is impacting our ability to bring together these key players and produce our reports in a timely way. We are set to put out the three main assessment reports of our current cycle in the next two years. But like many other organizations, we are having to delay their release as we seek to find to work within the constraints of this pandemic bring the play together. Second, on a more optimistic note, the current slowdown to the global economy is frankly giving us a chance to observe and research the effects of lower greenhouse gas emissions and to incorporate these findings in our next report. This climate experiment uh, that is happening right before our eyes should yield information that can inform policymakers and society with the choices they need to make. Thank you, Doctor. Now to Dr. Larie Gaudry. Thank you, Meg, and greetings uh, to all. Uh, about a year ago, uh, the uh, IBES released the uh, Global Assessment of Diversity uh, and Ecosystem Services, and I will share uh, with you uh, five of its uh, main uh, findings. Uh, the first one is that uh, Marine uh, biodiversity has been uh, declining uh, uh, at an unprecedented rate over the past 50 years. And for example, almost one third of reef formal forming corals uh, 
uh, as well as more than a third of uh, marine mammals are threatened uh, with uh, extinction. And number two, uh, this degradation of the oceans and this uh, loss of uh, biodiversity is affecting uh, the contributions that uh, people uh, derive uh, from nature, including the capacity of uh, us to regulate uh, our climate and to also feed people. Three, uh, the causes of this loss of uh, biodiversity are known. There are five uh, direct uh, causes. The first one is fishing, over-exploitation of uh, resources. Uh, the second one is sea use, and by sea use, we mean uh, the uh, development of infrastructure as well as aquaculture, uh, for example. Three is climate change, and increasingly so. Four is pollution in all of its forms, and five is invasive species. And of course, uh, these five uh, causes uh, result from a set of indirect uh, underlying uh, uh, causes uh, that relate to our values, to our behaviors, uh, and include uh, our consumption uh, patterns, uh, dynamics of human population or governments, governance at a local or global uh, levels, to take a few examples. Fourth, most of the uh, Aichi targets of the strategic plan for biodiversity will be missed. And uh, if current uh, declining biodiversity trends uh, continue, we will also not be achieving many of the sustainable uh, development goals. Five, and finally, uh, and importantly, solutions uh, exist, and it is not too late to act. Uh, let me cite a few uh, of these uh, solutions. Uh, so uh, one of them, of course, is to rebuild uh, over-exploited fish stocks. We know how to do that. Uh, we need to enforce global agreements for responsible fisheries. We need to eliminate illegal fishing, to name just a few. Then we also, uh, and that's what uh, the global assessment of IBES concluded, we need to halt harmful subsidies. We need to reduce uh, on land, the use of fertilizers, the use of pesticides. In other words, we need to promote agroecological uh, practices. We also need to expand and manage more uh, effectively our network of protected uh, areas. We need to reduce uh, the uh, environmental impact of our aquaculture. So these are just uh, some of uh, the solutions that are already in existence. We know how to do this. We just actually need to implement uh, these solutions. In terms of um, COVID-19 and the work of IBES, uh, so far, uh, we're on track. IBES has moved uh, completely uh, to virtual work, and we've been uh, having uh, our uh, meetings uh, virtually, including two scoping meetings for two new reports. So uh, for now, uh, IBES is not envisaging any delay, but of course we are monitoring this very closely and we will see uh, how things uh, develop. The next few months will be uh, crucial in the capacity of uh, IBES uh, to deliver. Thank you very much. Thank you both. So as we can see, the scientific work goes on even in the presence of the pandemic. Ambassador Thompson and Secretaries Mrema and Espinosa, my second question is for you, starting with Secretary Mrema. These science efforts your colleagues just described are absolutely critical for informing major deliberations and negotiations for a global action on ocean health, climate and biodiversity. And you're each at the center of those efforts. How has the pandemic impacted international deliberations on these topics, the timing of negotiations, and anticipated decision points? Secretary Mrema? This was to be a super year for the oceans. It was also meant to be the super year for biodiversity with the adoption of the post-2020 Global Biodiversity Framework. The 196 parties to the Convention on Biological Diversity 
for the past 10 years have been working tirelessly to achieve the Aichi Biodiversity Targets adopted by the Convention on Biological Diversity Conference of the Parties in 2010. These targets have a deadline to expire this year, 2020. Thus, the CBD parties are now negotiating the successor of the Aichi Biodiversity Targets, namely the post-2020 Global Biodiversity Framework. This is intended to be a transformative framework that will put the world on a path towards the 2050 vision of living in harmony with nature. This will not just be a framework for the CBD parties and its parties alone, but for the entire global community. As such, this framework must incorporate ambitious targets and goals for the oceans. It must enshrine and solidify political commitments for conserving our precious ocean ecosystems, but also for ensuring that the ocean can continue to play a pivotal role in its major work to support livelihood, food security, economic growth, and social well being. It must also catalyze action by all facets of the society. Unfortunately, the adoption of the framework has been delayed by the COVID-19 pandemic. But the pandemic has also demonstrated that human disturbances of ecosystems and biodiversity and biodiversity loss are increasingly linked to the occurrence and risks of disease spread, both zoonotic and vector-borne diseases. We now have clearly see the need to protect biodiversity in order to prevent the emergency of these pandemics. But we are also reminded that nature and the diversity of microorganisms, flora and fauna is the basis for human health. Whether it is the source of medicine like antibiotics or the traditional medicinal practices that use wild animals and plants, or the basis of healthy diets, clean water, protecting biodiversity demonstrate the linkage between nature and health. As we negotiate the post-2020 Global Biodiversity Framework, we will also underline the importance of one healthy approach which recognizes the intrinsic connection between human health, animal health, and the health and resilience of nature. The pandemic has also shown us that we need to ensure that our negotiations do contribute to post-pandemic recovery program that will be, in the words of our Secretary General, build back better. Thank you so much, Secretary. Next, we go to Secretary Espinosa. The Paris Agreement made it clear that nations need to stabilize global temperatures at 1.5 degrees to avoid the worst impacts of climate change. But the world is falling short of that goal. And while they have made some progress, nations are not keeping up with the commitments they have made under the agreement. The latest estimates show that the world is not on a path of 1.5 degrees, but is instead on a trajectory to more than double it. Every climate model we have seen, every chart and every projection shows that this will have profoundly negative impacts on human life upon planet Earth. In fact, we are already seeing them. Planet Earth registered its second hottest year on record in 2019. This capped off a five-year period that ranks as the warmest span in recorded history. In 2019, hurricanes, wildfires, and floods cost the world $150 billion. 
in addition to the irreplaceable losses of lives, losses for business and the economy before COVID-19 came were already expected to increase because of a decade-long rise in natural catastrophes with direct links to climate change. So, while COVID-19 may have postponed COP26, the subsidiary bodies, and other important dates on our negotiations calendar, it has not postponed the need for parties to accelerate work towards fulfilling commitments they have already made. We simply don't have the luxury of time anymore. Nor does it postpone the requirement for nations to submit or revise their National Climate Action Plans, or NDCs, in 2020. So how are we at UN Climate Change dealing with this major adjustment? Very well so far. For better or worse, we are used to working on tremendous challenges against the clock. The bottom line is that UN Climate Change's work in 2020 is not in any form on hold. The climate emergency has not taken time off for the coronavirus, and neither have we. We all are working remotely. Groups are meeting virtually, and we are maximizing our efforts to ensure that we continue to support global efforts to address climate change and reduce emissions. And we continue our work with parties and non-party stakeholders to reflect the urgency of the climate change agenda. We will also continue to encourage leaders throughout the world, as UN Secretary General Guterres said, to recover better. That means greening COVID-19 recovery investments. It really is our great opportunity to reshape the world for the 21st century. One that is not based simply on extraction and consumption, but with an eye to a more sustainable and resilient future. People have now seen what cleaner skies look like. They see the numbers that show emission levels have been significantly reduced. While nobody suggests that it should take a global crisis to achieve this, it has allowed people to see what is possible if all segments of society work and plan together for a cleaner, greener, healthier future. One that is not based on crisis, but careful planning and collaboration. Thank you, Secretary Espinosa. And now we move on to Ambassador Thompson. Thank you very much, Meg, and uh, hello to everybody listening in. Uh, can I preface my remarks by thanking UN Foundation for the foresight of getting together the ocean community with the biodiversity community and the climate community. We're all connected, uh, and as I'll say in my remarks, uh, it's all part of the same process, really. Um, I'd also like to use the moment to just express a bit of empathy. I think it is a time when we need to all ex uh, exercise the best of our empathy for those who really are suffering during this pandemic. Uh, this is a time also, of course, where we've got to use all our powers, not just of sharing, but of innovating and being more entrepreneurial uh, and in, in all of our thinking. Uh, we, we are homo sapiens. We know how to think our way out of problems. Uh, it's true that the super year has been disrupted uh, for the ocean and uh, for biodiversity and the climate, but it's no more than that. Uh, the conferences will be held and we remain steadfastly dedicated to fulfilling the mandates we've been given by international agreement and meeting the targets that have been set under those agreements. So things like the UN Ocean Conference uh, will be held and they will be, uh, they'll be held as soon as conditions allow. Uh, I want you to know that Portugal and Kenya, who I'm in touch with regularly, are absolutely determined to host a very vibrant UN Ocean Conference that is going to provide new ideas uh, and uh, new solutions in the areas of innovation and science for uh, better ocean health. So um, those dates will be announced in due course, but in the meantime, step-by-step -step preparations are underway at the UN Secretariat and with the co-hosts. 
you know, most of us are still confined within the tunnel of the COVID-19 pandemic, uh, but we are now looking at the light ahead at the end of the tunnel and the, the road that leads to economic recovery. And I put it to you that, you know, this is the time when our voices should be heard uh, in favor of a high road that takes us uh, to a clean green transition, a road I like to call the blue green recovery road. Uh, at this time, this, this moment in history, uh, you know, there are huge decisions being taken, massive decisions on financial commitments. Uh, and before the seal is set on them, we have to ensure that the consequences to, of taking the low road back to where we were with uh, polluting fossil fuel uh, dependence uh, has to be understood and avoided. So governments and development banks and agencies, corporations, none of them should be allowed to wash their hands of long-term responsibility in the name of short-term expedience. So I urge you to think now about the six principles that UN Secretary General uh, Guterres laid down in his Earth Day address last month, principles that included ending fossil fuel uh, subsidies and polluters being made to pay for their pollution and investing public funds into a future of sustainable projects that help the environment and climate. And with IPBES and IPCC present, um, thank you so much for your great work. Uh, remember that it was on the basis of your reports that the Secretary General in uh, Madrid last December said that we are knowingly destroying the life support systems of this planet. So that's the situation we're in. In the end, the ocean's well-being depends on the drastic lowering of our greenhouse gas emissions. If you care about health, care about those emissions. For from them, we witness you know, acidification, deoxygenation, and of course, warming. And if you're talking about warming, uh, of course, you're talking about the death of coral, uh, rising sea levels, uh, movement of species away from traditional habitats uh, to obviously the detriment of coastal communities. Uh, that's whether you're coming up from an ocean perspective or a biodiversity perspective. All roads really lead to Glasgow next year and the achievement of solid results out of COP26. The self-interest of our species, I would say, demands that unprecedented reductions in anthropogenic greenhouse gas emissions around the world must be central to our building back better. Only then will we reverse the decline in the ocean health, as uh, I'm sure we all wish. Thank you. Thank you, Ambassador Thompson. Now we'll turn to questions from our Capitol Hill Ocean Week participants. And the first question is for Secretary Mema. Secretary, as we've heard, the connections among the ocean, climate, biodiversity, and human well being are increasingly well understood thanks to the work of the IPCC and IPBIS. And we've seen this playing out in international fora around the globe. Secretary Rama, the Convention on Biological Diversity is currently drafting a framework that will guide global conservation and sustainable development efforts for the next decade. Where do you see the links between biodiversity and the ocean, and how will the new CBD framework strengthen this connection? The linkage between ocean, climate, and biodiversity have long been a major priority for the parties to the Convention on Biological Diversity. Our Secretariat, together with the parties and many stakeholders, have coordinated a wide range of work on marine biodiversity and climate change, including on ecologically and biologically significant marine areas, regional ocean governance, and ecosystems-based approaches to climate change adaptation, among others. These critical interlinkages must also be instilled in the post-2020 global biodiversity framework. Just as the ocean underpins the entire global ecosystem, it is present in some form throughout uh, nearly all elements of the draft framework. As the state of the ocean health has continued to decline over the years, we see a new spirit of openness and collaboration across different sectors and stakeholders. 
we now have a very productive engagement and collaboration with many different ocean sectors working not only on conservation, but also on sustainable use. The conservation community is now working more closely with the economic sectors, recognizing that we cannot achieve our collective goals without collaboration. These various stakeholders groups will see their own priorities and interests reflected in the post-2020 Global Biodiversity Framework. We will need all sectors and stakeholders to play an active role also in implementing the framework. And it is our hope that to be able to achieve the ocean that is not only adequately protected, but also that can deliver the services to human beings we need to survive and strive. So the framework will be important in that area. All right. Uh, thank you so much, Secretary Mrema. Now we'll ask Secretary Espinosa to respond. First, I want to say that the ocean is an integral part of the climate system and that when we are talking about raising ambition with respect to climate change, we are also talking about ambition with respect to the ocean. I would also like to congratulate Co-President Chile for bringing the ocean's agenda to the forefront of the agenda and for building on the strong foundation that had been established leading up to COP25. The ocean climate biodiversity nexus is recognized under the Convention and the Paris Agreement. So it is vital that our response to climate change includes consideration of the ocean. We know that net zero emissions are needed urgently to limit further ocean warming and ocean acidification. And net zero, coupled with strong adaptation measures, are needed to limit associated impacts and risks of current and future changes due to climate change. That's why we urge parties to urgently reduce fossil fuel emissions to net zero to limit further ocean temperature rise and acidification. Second, to consider all opportunities for building and supporting ocean and coastal zone related resilience. Moving forward, as an outcome from COP25, the COP mandated that an ocean dialogue happen at SB52. These discussions are scheduled to take place this October. This dialogue is important to our process because it will consider how to strengthen mitigation and adaptation action on the ocean and climate change. It has already had a strong response with over 40 submissions received so far from parties and non-party stakeholders to advise the dialogue. And in a broader sense, UN Climate Change will continue supporting parties in their work under the Convention and Paris Agreement to coordinate ocean-related work under the Convention, coordinate knowledge sharing internally and externally to promote coherence, and liaise with other UN agencies to support relevant action, including for the UN Ocean Conference and the UN Decade on Ocean Science. Ambassador Thompson, just this week, more than 100 prominent marine scientists urged governments to support ambitious conservation protections, including a 30 by 30 target for the ocean, which means 30% of the ocean should be reserved for marine protected areas by 2030. What are you seeing and hearing about the global commitment for more sustainable ocean governance? Uh, firstly, I'd say that the 30 by 30 movement is snowballing. Uh, it was, you know, obviously quite ambitious when first mentioned, but it's really snowballing now. A lot of big countries getting behind it. Uh, main job now, of course, is to make sure the SDG 14.5, which is 10 by 20, in other words, 10% of the ocean conserved by the end of this year. I believe that is doable, uh, particularly if Kamla and many people here have got influence at Kamla. Uh, if Kamla looks after its um, 
three marine protected areas uh, which have the potential for coming on when they meet in October this year, I believe we can get to SDG 14.5, but we need those CAMLA MPAs to come in. Another target that can be uh, successfully reached this year is SDG 14.5, and uh, mention was made by Anne of uh, fisheries subsidies. Well, the WTO General Council meets in December, and the ambassadors are negotiating furiously now to try and get agreement by December. And if we do that, we will have reached SDG 14.5. You know, so these things are doable during this uh, time of um, postponements. Uh, the third point that I'd make is that the BBNJ conference, uh, obviously, uh, that was also progressing really positively after the three conferences were held. The fourth was due. But that's had to be postponed. Um, I mean, excellent chairmanship, excellent input by all countries. So again, I feel very optimistic that we're going to end up with uh, uh, some effective, an effective and universal treaty there for the better governance of the high seas, one that must stand the test of time like UNCLOS. And just my last point, uh, and this again goes back to when we were all in Madrid, and I was on a panel with my prime minister from Fiji, uh, where we were pushing the fact that, you know, EEZs are um, responsibilities as well as rights for countries, and that under UNCLOS, uh, countries with EEZ have an obligation to protect and preserve the marine environment. So we were calling in that 100% marine spatial planning by 2030 and for 30% marine protected areas by 2030, and everybody's EEZ. Thank you. Thank you, Ambassador Thompson. Our next round of questions relate to keeping civil society engaged in a virtual world. As we all know, public engagement is such a vital part of your organization's work. I'd like to focus on how you as leaders will ensure that civil society is able to participate with your organizations, both in the immediate term and then over the many months to come as we transition into a post-pandemic world? And in the longer term, how might we reimagine and enhance civil engagement in solution development and implementation through the work of your respective international organizations? Let's start with Dr. Barrett and Dr. Larie Gargery, since much of your work is done by scientists who actually volunteer their time and efforts. What challenges and opportunities do you see in the near and long term for civil engagement and action? Dr. Larie Gardery? Thank you uh, very much. And you, you're right to point out uh, the uh, importance uh, of uh, the work of uh, 100 scientists that commit their time uh, and ideas uh, freely on a voluntary basis to both uh, IBES and IPCC. Those are really the, the, the treasures of, uh, of IBES and of IPCC. And, and beyond uh, the scientists, uh, IBES also uh, involves a large uh, community of stakeholders, and which includes indigenous people and local uh, communities, conservation organizations, but also uh, uh, networks of uh, private company, name uh, just a few. And as uh, mentioning earlier, uh, we are building on early earlier work. We've been uh, in the past few years uh, trying to work a little bit uh, virtually. So we are not fully starting from scratch. We've held a few uh, events uh, virtually. And now we are uh, building uh, on this. But of course, COVID-19, uh, like for all of us, has taken us to uh, really a whole new level in terms of uh, virtual work since like uh, everyone else, we have been, uh, we've gone fully virtual uh, since, uh, since March. Uh, and so we've held, for example, uh, virtually two scoping meetings that is unprecedented, each with 60 uh, people. And we've really been able to work very well, both in plenary and in breakout groups. And now the uh, scoping report is uh, going to governments for their review. So it is possible. And, and in July, we are going to have a new event. It's a workshop on biodiversity and pandemics. Uh, 
that is going to look at uh, the uh, origin of pandemics and also at option action to prevent the risk of future uh, pandemics. And that will, of course, be uh, a fully virtual workshop at the end of July, and governments and others have received uh, the call for nomination. So again, the work is on track and we don't envisage currently any delays, but that is uh, only what we can say uh, at this stage. Um, we're going to try and continue. Uh, and when things come back to normal, uh, hopefully, uh, we will uh, uh, use uh, lessons learned during this period and uh, we will uh, conduct some of our work uh, virtually both uh, to save the time of our experts to also save on, on carbon and uh, reduce uh, climate change. And so I think that we will uh, try to make uh, most the most out of this uh, period. Of course, flagging immediately that there are some big events that simply cannot be held virtually. Uh, those are uh, when our governments come, our plenary meetings, and we have one uh, that is uh, scheduled for early uh, uh, to see uh, what will happen. Uh, to, and so. Uh, learning from uh, the current situation, trying to keep some of that to be uh, more innovative in our future work. But of course, uh, with the idea that we can't uh, move uh, permanently, virtually uh, in, the, in the months and years to come. Thank you. Thank you. Dr. Barrett, how are you using your leadership position to enhance civil engagement with the IPCC? Uh, well, uh, thank, thank you for that. Um, so, Meg, you know, um, engagement of the public and civil society is a really important aspect of the work of the IPCC. Uh, civil society is an important contributor to user of our reports. And as citizens grow more knowledgeable about climate change and are driven by science to choose the actions they will take, our reports have become used more broadly than by governments and policymakers. So some way, um, one of the ways that we use, um, say, our leadership positions to get the word out is every time we're in a country for a IPCC meeting, whether it's an adoption meeting or, or a plenary, we make sure that we um, hold engagement and outreach activities. Usually they're centered at a university, but um, often the, the invitation list is quite broad so that anyone who's interested in learning more about IPCC, um, about the work, how they can contribute, they are um, invited to participate. Also, uh, we try very hard to make our summaries very accessible to the public. And we invite public comment into the review and drafting of our reports. And this will continue to work. That's, uh, we're internet organization, much like IPBES, dependent on the engagement of members from around the world. And COVID is presenting quite a challenge as we look to engage folks from places where virtual connectivity is a challenge at present. But we need their engagement and input. It's so vital to, um, to our reports and, and the, broad, uh, the broad information that we look to assess. So we are considering ways to start working just heard from Anne to ensure that we, we have the we require. But the current situation brings home, quite frankly, what a global village we truly are. The capacities of the least of us drive our ability to connect. And um, though, though we're reliant on virtual connect at present, some of our work really requires face engagement. IPCC is looking at ways to take the virtual world world, which frankly, as Dan has the benefit of using greenhouse gas emissions and combining it with the face-to-face -face collaboration we need with scientists, government, business, and the public. So that we do use the events um, that the planet needs. Thank you, Dr. Barrett. We're going to stay on this topic of civil engagement and now turn to Secretaries Espinosa and Rema. 
the engagement of civil society, including voices from the conservation organization community, indigenous peoples, the private sector, youth, and, and much more, is central to the adoption and implementation of the actions we need to preserve biodiversity and to address climate change. How are you reimagining ways to safeguard and even expand public engagement? Secretary Mrema. Although the Convention on Biological Diversity is a party-driven process, it has done a lot to integrate the perspective of a wide range of stakeholders. We have an entire stream of work under the convention focused on engaging indigenous peoples and local communities, engaging the youth, engaging the private sector, engaging the non-governmental organizations, and all have contributed significantly to the work and the deliberations under the convention. We have had many different opportunities and means for input of civil society into the development of the post-2020 Global Biodiversity Framework. This input have included through thematic consultations and workshops with the participation of civil society, have also included written input from all stakeholders throughout the process. Have also included specific suggestions which have been received on the goals and targets. The process has also included public review and comment on the many documents informing the negotiation process. Despite the challenges that COVID-19 presents, we will indeed do all that we can to ensure that the rest of the process continues to be open, inclusive, and transparent. We are pressed with the need not to delay the development and adoption of the framework and are re-examining all ways in which we can continue to advance the process. We can continue to engage with the civil society while managing the impacts that this pandemic has had on all of us. And now I'll turn to Secretary Espinosa. As I noted earlier, UN Climate Change will continue working with parties and non-party stakeholders to reflect the urgency of the climate change agenda. Again, the need for climate change action did not stop with the arrival of COVID-19. Yet, it does change the way we carry out that work. First, I want to note that we have worked in this collaborative manner with non-state actors such as youth, indigenous groups, regions, businesses, and more for several years as part of what we call inclusive multilateralism. Essentially, it goes beyond multilateralism as we know it, an approach that recognizes that governments alone cannot solve climate change. It takes the efforts of all segments of society. We are, for example, engaging youth on a regular basis. There is no doubt that they've had an incredible impact upon the climate change discussions in the last few years. This has really helped to put climate change on the lips of people throughout the world. And we saw progress at COP25 with respect to the indigenous groups and cities. But businesses and investors have also led the charge. Just last week, in the largest ever UN-backed, CEO-led climate advocacy effort to date, major multinationals reaffirmed their own science-based commitments to achieving zero carbon economy and called on governments to match their ambition. Specifically, 155 companies with a combined market capitalization of more than 2.4 trillion and representing more than 5 million employees, signed a statement urging governments around the world to align their COVID-19 economic aid and recovery efforts with the latest climate science. The signatories span 34 sectors and have headquarters in 33 countries. The question, however, is how we will continue that work. 
The answer is every way possible. That's not an empty statement. From June 1st to June 10th, we are hosting a series of online events that will give parties and other stakeholders the opportunity to continue exchanging views and sharing information. We are doing this in order to maintain momentum in the UNFCCC process and to showcase how climate action is progressing under the special circumstances the world is currently facing. This will include advancing technical work, but it will also provide a platform for information exchange and engagement on other work being done under the UNFCCC on topics such as adaptation, mitigation, science, finance, technology, capacity building, transparency, gender, action on climate empowerment, and the preparation and submission of nationally determined contributions. And while more details will be released at the event, this week we'll also see the launch of a special Race to Zero campaign. As we lead up to COP26, the Race to Zero will help mobilize cities, regions, businesses, and investors, all of whom are committed to the same overarching goal, achieving net zero emissions by 2050 at the very latest and getting those plans included in their national climate action plans in 2020. As you can see, our work with both state and non-state actors is doing anything but slowing down. As we look to this idea of recovering better, that foundation of cooperation that we established prior to COVID-19 is really going to give us room to grow. Important relationships have already been established. Is there room to grow? Of course, that work continues on a daily basis, but we are proud of the work we've done with civil society to ensure continuity through this current crisis. We're going to um, now move to Ambassador Thompson on the same topic. Although the UN Ocean Conference is postponed, you and your team continue to engage people all over the world virtually. How are you maintaining momentum for ocean action across the communities and sectors that are really vital to this work? Well, thanks for that, Meg. Um, uh, UNDESA has been running a great series of webinars. I'm sure some of you have been part of them. There was one on the, that engaged youth around the world. There was another one engaging private sector, the UN Global Compact. We've got another one coming up with SCAP, uh, addressing Asia Pacific, and so on. So a good job being done by UNDESA. But I particularly want to respond to that question by telling you about the virtual ocean, the virtual ocean dialogues, which we're putting on next week. This is a major undertaking by the World Economic Forum and the Friends of Ocean Action. Uh, just let me quickly describe it to you now. Um, from Monday to Friday next week, there will be two thematic dialogues every day. Uh, and those thematic dialogues are all related to supporting SDG 14 and the UN Ocean Conference. Um, they, they bring together leaders from business community, from governments, from scientific community, and from NGOs uh, with expert panels uh, and with each of the dialogues uh, headed off by a recorded video message from a head of government, uh, Prime Minister of Norway, President of Palau, President of uh, Kenya, Prime Minister of Canada, uh, His Serene Highness from uh, Monaco. Uh, I know those are some of the, uh, the, the, the messages coming in. They, they are aimed at solutions, these dialogues, at conveying those solutions, not just to the UN Ocean Conference, but to the CBD Conference and to the climate cops. Uh, I urge you all to go and have a look at the uh, website, just put in virtual ocean dialogues, you'll get to the uh, World Economic Forum website and there you can register because these uh, dialogues have been designed to be open to everyone and to be interactive. So um, it's gonna be a big week uh, and uh, I'm, I'm really pleased that I have this opportunity of promoting it to you all because I really do hope that you will be able to be part of the scaling of solutions which we see these 
virtual ocean dialogues being for SDG 14. Thanks. Thank you, Ambassador. I'm definitely tuning into those virtual dialogues. And now for our final question. The UN Secretary General has spoken about the need and the opportunity to build back better as we emerge from this pandemic. And as you all look ahead into the new decade, how can we ensure that the ocean, climate, biodiversity, and human well being are included in recovery efforts from a science and policy perspective? We'll go first to Secretary Mrema. This tragic global phenomena that has impacted each and every one of us offers an opportunity, as in the words of the Secretary General, to build back better. It provides a clear illustration of why we need to better understand our relationship with the natural world and why we need to do more to live in harmony with nature. It highlights why we must raise awareness of the importance of the issues such as biodiversity and health, wild species protection in natural health ecosystems, halting environmental degradation, and the fundamental links between all elements, as well as the social economic conditions, human health and well-being. And I'm hopeful that new and innovative ways of living, of working, and coexisting with nature will emerge from this generation defining the moment in time. Thank you so much, Secretary Mrema. And now to you, Dr. Laurie Gaudry. What uh, to do is create a diversity center, all sectors beyond uh, the uh, environmental uh, sectors. So uh, that includes uh, fisheries, uh, for example, since uh, the agriculture and fisheries uh, ministries need to place biodiversity at the heart of, of their policies. That includes uh, climate. We've seen that uh, biodiversity and climate need to be uh, considered uh, together in order to uh, design policies that are mutually reinforcing each other and not mutually uh, exclusive. That includes uh, health as well. Uh, we've seen in the context of the current pandemics uh, that uh, the emergence of new uh, diseases can be exacerbated uh, by uh, human activities such as uh, deforestation or habitat fragmentation, and that it is therefore key to bring to the health uh, sector with uh, the people who uh, care uh, and know uh, biodiversity and uh, the environment in order for that particular example to avoid future uh, pandemics. So again, we really need to bring awareness about the biodiversity to make sure that biodiversity is seen as an integrative part of all of these uh, economic uh, sectors. So uh, the uh, key word here is let us uh, integrate uh, biodiversity in all economic sectors. And that also includes policies uh, related to uh, the ocean. Thank you so much, Doctor. Ambassador Thompson, the question to you now about building back better. Um, well, you've heard me on the subject of the blue-green recovery road, and I won't repeat what I said there about the uh, Secretary General's six principles that he gave on Earth Day recently, but I do uh, ask listeners just to have a look at those if they haven't already, because I think the fundamentals are there. Um, I would just like to say that, look, this is um, its not a quixotic uh, <laughs> enterprise this the blue green recovery road it's it's the logical way forward you know we don't want to be back in this position that we're in now in 10 years time which is where we will be if we go back to our old ways we need to go forward to a better future and so you know i personally i don't use the term building back better because i don't like going back i want to go forward uh in fiji we have an expression raiki lu look ahead you know i don't want to go back uh, so, uh, because we were going in the wrong direction, as you heard from Patricia Espinosa there, uh, you know, towards a three-degree world, 
That, that's just not acceptable. That's a world without coral reefs, for example. You know, I was so heartened the other day to see the Chilean NDC that was put in uh, the other day, the nationally determined contribution under the UNFCCC COP uh, 26 preparations, you know, where they, as part, Chile, as part of its NDC, said that they were aiming to be a global power in the production of green hydrogen. And that's no idle uh, dream, you know, because they've got the Atacama Desert and they've got so much solar power, which is the basis for producing uh, green hydrogen. And why would they want to be the global power? It's because we're on the cusp of a revolution in the powering of the global shipping fleet, which is a huge polluter, right? And so this, the people that are prepared to invest in things like the production of green hydrogen, as the Chileans are prepared to do, will be the winners of the future. And so will we all because we will no longer be polluted by one of the worst forms of pollution, which is bunker fuel for powering the global shipping fleet. So, as I say, it's not a quixotic pursuit. It's doable. We just have to get our minds in the right places and then spend our money and invest our public funds accordingly. Uh, and that would be my main message. Thank you, Ambassador. Now we'll ask Secretary Espinosa to respond. On the issue of recovering better, as the Secretary General noted. If we get it right, by recovering better, we can help steer the global recovery towards a more sustainable and inclusive path. While this period we're going through right now is enormously challenging, we must recognize that we are also being offered the opportunity to get ourselves on the right track with respect to sustainable development, climate change, biodiversity, and more. But we must begin today, and that means recognizing that we already have a framework in place for all of this action, specifically the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development and the Paris Agreement on Climate Change. These took years of careful planning and negotiation to develop. I always say that the Paris Agreement is a covenant of hope with the people of the world, and never have we needed that hope to be matched with action like we do right now? This is our chance. Nations can begin right now. Their national climate action plans are due in 2020, this year. They have not been delayed due to COVID-19. We don't have the luxury of time. Plans and policies related to science, biodiversity, the protection of the ocean, of our forest, all of these can and should be included in these plans. They are only submitted once every five years. So this opportunity to build a more sustainable future is coming together with this year's key date. The writing on the wall could not be any clearer. But whether we're talking about the ocean, the climate, biodiversity, the environment in general, our health. One thing that I'm hopeful for is for people not to forget just how much we're depending on science at this very moment. I want people to someday look back and say, let's not forget how we depended upon science to cut through the fog of disinformation that existed back then. And let's not forget how especially with the massive amounts of information we're all dealing with, that science is and should be our common language. Who knows? Maybe this dependence on science right now will lead to some little girl or boy in school right now to make science their career path. And that child grows up to make that key difference when the world needs it most. Or maybe she's part of a team that does. The point is that this person could, because of the emphasis on science today, make a huge difference tomorrow, whether it's climate change, health, or any field. Dr. Barrett, the question to you is, how do we build forward better together 
including ocean, climate, and biodiversity as key features of our recovery efforts. So the IPCC is um, an organization that assesses available climate information. Um, we not we try to be policy relevant. We, so they need to have available to all pathways the best information on the oceans, biodiversity, climate that we can assess and provide uh, to policymakers and the public. Um, the best way to go forward is to take advantage of all the wonderful research that's going on around the world and to capture that in our reports, but in other such as um, IPBES and others, uh, to get that information there to the world so they can take action on it. I want to thank all of our panelists for their insightful and um, very comprehensive responses. Um, it really helps us understand how our, our key international bodies are looking to weave together ocean, climate, biodiversity, and human well-being as we all move forward together. To close this session, I'd like to thank each of the panelists for sharing um, their thinking about how our work is progressing, even in the pandemic, at the nexus of ocean, climate, biodiversity, and human well-being, as well as thanking them for their leadership. Um, we know it's critical in continuing to highlight these connections and to build momentum for science and policy actions that benefit the health of our ocean and the economic and social well-being of individuals and communities around the world. We really applaud you for keeping these critical issues front and center. As we look to the road ahead, it's important to continue to ask ourselves, what is possible now that wasn't before? How can we reimagine our relationship with the ocean and how can we reimagine how we work across institutions and natural systems to emerge stronger and more resilient? I hope that today's conversation will be the first of many as we explore answers to what might be possible. And I look forward to seeing how those of you listening will pick up that charge in the days ahead. Thank you all for joining us. Mm -hmm.